So uh, we are going to be talking about jRuby today, and since some people have asked, uh, it's not going to be as deeply technical as the one we did last year, talking about method dispatch and optimizations and whatnot. Um, we're going to be a little bit more about practical detail, details, actually running applications, building stuff. So we will jump right into it now. I should see if my mic works. Uh, yes. Yeah. All right. I'm so live. Tom is on, and what happened to? Oh, right. Okay. There you go. <laughs> so um, the agenda. You can just scan it with your eyes. We're going to hit all these as we go. Hopefully, we'll have enough time to get through all this and have uh, room so, for some questions at the so end. So there's 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 a short story here with the pictures, and we'll maybe leave it to the end to see if people can figure out the theme. Yeah. See if you can figure out where all these pictures come from and what the common thread is. Um, a quick question, though. Um, how many people are using JRuby right now? Cool. Okay. So it's probably about half the room that's not using it, and that's that's ideal. Those are probably the the best people to be in here, since some of the others are already kind of sold on on some of the benefits. Um, so we are the JRuby guys. I'm Charlie, and I'm Tom, and uh, we've been working on JRuby for quite a while. Now been at Sun Microsystems for about two years, working full time on JRuby. Um, we do work from home in Minneapolis. There's not really a, a technical sun office up there. So uh, we work from home, and that home usually means at a coffee shop these days. So we get together a lot for that. And uh, we've kind of become, well, I don't know if we're, we're <laughs> willing conference junkies, but we've, we've got at least a conference every month that we present at. And uh, I think the most we've had at any given time was we each had three, three trips yeah. in a given month. So we for, do for too many. Conferences. It is too many. And uh, trying to balance that with getting stuff done is, a, is an interesting challenge. Uh, OK. So a year on from JRuby last year, it's amazing how much has changed. Um, last year, we had just barely gotten the compiler finished. And it, it wasn't to the point where it ran all the tests, and it wasn't 100% correct. So it was done, but not really done. Um, as we proceeded on, we did a series of release candidates for JRuby 1.1 in the, the following winter. And since then, we've done five uh, maintenance releases to the 1.1 line. Uh, we are on 1.1.5 now. And uh, the numbers kind of amazed me when I started looking this up. So we fixed 113 actual user-reported bugs uh, in 1.1.5 and 1,500 user-reported bugs since last year. Uh, similarly, have 411 revisions in the repository since one one in one one five, which is about two months worth of work, uh, and over 3,000 revisions since last year. So there's been a lot of work going on. Uh, to to kind of put this in perspective, the JRuby repository just crossed 8,000 revisions. So three eighths of the JRuby work has actually happened in the last year. So it's 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 pretty funny too. Um, a year ago when we were here, we were saying, it's done, it's, it's compatible, use it, and <laughs> we've fixed 1,500 bugs since then. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's a never ending battle on that, but you know, each year we say compatibility is more done than it was before. Um, and, and it really is getting to the point now where almost everything should work. Uh, okay. There's not a lot of outstanding Ruby compatibility issues left. So if last year it was medium well in steak parlance, now it's uh, like shoe leather. Yes, exactly. Shoe leather, it's, all, it's, it's starting to turn into a block of coal at this point. So we're getting very close to really, really done. Um, performance is very good right now. Um, the, you know, I'm not going to dive into this a lot, but performance in general, on micro benchmarks, JRuby is the fastest Ruby implementation. Um, but microbenchmarks don't always translate to application performance. And so there's continuing work to figure out bottlenecks in our core libraries, bottlenecks in the way we run a Ruby code. And it's going to always be improving. So we've got a lot of room there. We still have continents to explore. We still have continents of performance to, to explore, like some of the other implementations do. Um, and 1.9 support we've now started to add. Because 1.8.6 is looking good, we're actually going to add 1.9 support. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the first thing we realized over the past year is that just trying to sell JRuby as, yeah, it's, it's just Ruby, and it's a great Ruby, and you, know, you can use it, and it's Ruby, doesn't really focus on why this is a good idea and why this is an important thing to remember. Um, so we started talking a little bit more about what actually makes JRuby a great implementation. And really, it comes down to the JDK, Hotspot. Uh, so Hotspot is the optimizing virtual machine that's part of OpenJDK, the open source uh, Java development kit. 
And uh, we, we, you know, the number is like 500 man years. This is some sort of estimate that comes out of sun. But there, are, there is undoubtedly a lot of effort put into this thing. Um, legendary dynamic optimizations that it's able to do. Um, the GC, you know, other VMs look at the hotspot GC as a pinnacle of where garbage collection can get to if you really work on it for a decade. Uh, so being able to take advantage of those things means that we don't have to worry about writing that stuff. Uh, Hotspot also has an optimizing native compiler, just-in-time compiler. We can actually turn on flags that'll show all of the assembly code that Hotspot actually turns Java into. And since we compile Ruby into J JVM bytecode, that's also getting jitted down to native code with optimizations run at runtime. Uh, it's extremely stable. Whenever we find a, a, a seg fault or a crash in the JVM, which I think has only happened two times in the past four or five years, we know it's automatically not our fault. It's the JVM's fault, and they will immediately prioritize and fix that. Uh, we've yeah. worked around a couple of those in cases, but it's, it's so rare to actually have a crash in the JVM that it's, it's almost non-existent. And it's generally from unusual bytecode generation where things like the Java compiler doesn't normally generate code that looks like that. Right, right. So they've got a whole body of Java code that they're testing against, which is coming out of Java compilers. And then my compiler comes along and does all this crazy stuff for Ruby, and thing, you know, things happen and things change. But they immediately recognize it as a problem of the JVM, and they fix it. The team that works on the JVM separately. Um, the other interesting thing about Hotspot is that it's actually a dynamic VM under the covers. Everyone thinks about the JVM being, oh, it's the Java VM, it runs Java code. And that's totally untrue. The JVM is a virtual machine that runs JVM bytecode. Any language that can compile down to JVM bytecode can run on this VM. And because of that, the, under the covers, it has to optimize much more than it has to be able to optimize as it runs, the same way that other Ruby implementations are going to have to do that sort of dynamic optimization. So by using the JVM, we've actually got probably one of the best dynamic language VMs under the covers already. And that's, that's a really important point. Um, it's, and of course, it's also per pervasive. Anybody that has uh, a Mac here, I think there's probably a few of you, you have Hotspot in the, the Apple JVM. And if you're running Linux, there's, you know, there's a ports you can install, there's uh, Debian packages, Red Hat packages, they're all over. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, there's, there's trivial installations for Windows as well. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of machines just come with it. And now that Java's open source, it will be on every Linux distribution. Right, now any, pl any platforms that OpenJDK didn't support a year ago, it's got support underway now. So it's going to be everywhere. <clears throat> so here is probably the most technical slide of the whole talk. Um, this is kind of where JRuby fits together with the JVM and how all the pieces work together. So on the left side, we've got Ruby code coming in. And anything in red is Ruby. Uh, anything in blue is, is Java or the JVM. So application code comes in, which is your app or Rails or whatever. Ruby standard library, we ship with just the normal Ruby standard library, which is all Ruby code. You can also pre-compile code into a dot .class file. And it's still just Ruby code, but it's Ruby compiled into bytecode. So that all passes in through the runtime. It gets parsed or class loaded. And then we've got an interpreted mode where we actually walk the Ruby AST at runtime, pretty typical like uh, Ruby 186. We've also got a bytecode way of executing. So either your pre-compiled code will come in and we'll run it as JVM bytecode, or as it executes, we will find hot methods and turn those into JVM bytecode eventually. Then they get the same optimizations that other JVM bytecode does. And then from there, it calls into the core classes, calls into the JVM, and calls into other Java libraries. And that's the general layout of how things all fit together inside the JRuby implementation. OK. so. We started to work on Ruby 1.9 support in earnest now. And actually, that's not true. For um, some time now, we've been porting libraries over to 1.9. Sort of pecking away at it. It's so, been, Ruby 1.9 has kind of been a moving target. So we, we've only done what seemed pretty stable, uh, only added the features that seemed like they were finished. So fibers, rational, complex, right, right. some 1.9 array methods, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we started porting the actual 1.9 parser itself. And uh, I'll take some blame that uh, it didn't get done by today. That was the original goal. But uh, it's, it's really, really close. So and the, it's, only, it's only taken, what, about a week's worth of work? Uh, a, a solid week, yeah. A solid week. My car blew up uh, during a trip, so it's kind of 
taken some time away from working on the parser. Um, Marson, when he ported the Onigaruma engine, actually did a lot of work towards supporting multinationalization. Right. For those of you that don't know, Onigaruma is the, the new regular expression engine that's included in Ruby 1.9, and it's the primary reason why character encoding and Unicode and other things are going to work so much better under 1.9 than they do under 1.8. And so naturally, to have that sort of support, we needed a, 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 an equivalent regular expression engine. And luckily, we had a JRuby community member that ported Onigaruma in about a month's worth of work. So that's, that's done, and it's a huge, huge help for us. And so those bits are there, but we haven't hooked them up together yet. Uh, geez, probably a year and a half ago, a uh, bytecode engine was made for running YARV bytecodes, and I don't think we're going to go too much further with this for the time being. It's still there. The idea that we had was if we actually could run YARV or Rubinius bytecode, that it would be faster than running our AST and walking the tree. Um, it turns out that now that we've got our tree walking optimized, hotspots inlining almost all of that stuff, and our AST walking is actually faster than uh, Ruby 1.9 in some cases. So it's unlikely that we're going to continue on the bytecode engine approach. However, if at some point there is a standard binary format for creating pre-compiled Ruby bytecode, we'll re-explore this and maybe uh, uh, build, another, build an engine that can run that code directly. Never say never. Never say never. Um, probably the most interesting thing about JRuby is 1.9 supports this enabled as a runtime switch, and that uh, just loads a few different classes and replaces a couple of others, and it's the same binary. Actually, I'll, go, I'll drop out to the demo now so you can see what that actually looks like in practice. Um, so I have uh, two, two examples of Ruby 1.9 stuff. So here is a simple test of the new fiber functionality, which is kind of like micro-threading stuff. Um, so creating a new fiber, doing some yielding, doing some resuming. And of course, this is only available under Ruby 1.9. So if I run this with just regular JRuby, uh, we get no such file to load, Fiber. There is no such library in Ruby 1.8. And if we take a look, see JRuby is Ruby 1.86 compatible here. But like I said, we have 1.9 support in the same binary. We figure people are going to want to be able to play with this on and off and not necessarily have two separate JRuby installs, like you have to have two separate Ruby installs. So if we look at JRuby-help, there is just a 1.9 flag. 1.8 1 is default, obviously, because most people are still using 1.8. So if I do dash dash 1.9 and then version, now it's actually Ruby 1.9 compatible. Patch level 114. Patch level 114. <laughs> obviously, we don't have the right patch level stuff on here because that's not quite set in stone yet. But Ruby 1.9 compatible. And if I run the fiber tests now, they all pass. And uh, uh, perhaps a better example, this is just a library thing, right? The parser, Tom is you know, a little uh, modest about this. The parser is not quite done yet, not all working. But it's working enough to support some of the uh, basic features that were added as one, part of 1.9. So here you see this, NetBeans is not liking this because this version of NetBeans only understands 1.8 syntax. Uh, but here you can have rest args show up earlier in the argument list. Uh, similarly, down here, we've got the new stabby uh, lambda syntax. And neither of these are going to work if I run this under Ruby 1.9 or Ruby 1.8 mode. Um, it doesn't even parse, because it doesn't know what, that, what that's all supposed to be. But we turn on Ruby 1.9 mode. And oops, I got to switch over. So it's not working on trunk. I have a separate window for in, the, in my In my tree. In, the, in Tom's tree. So I'll run it with 1.9 in so this one. one so other, one other unique requirement we have over the C implementation is that our AST gets used by all the Java IDEs for parsing. So that's one reason why. Um, NetBeans isn't showing that as valid code is because this parser hasn't been written yet for them to right. use it. Right, they actually use our parser. And so once we get this completed and we're satisfied with the Ruby 1.9 parser, NetBeans will also have full 1.9 support. And so will Eclipse and... So will Eclipse and, and everybody else that's using our parser yeah. too. So another advantage of, of having it uh, available in the Java side of things. And so the last thing on this list is that we're planning on getting this done as a, as a Christmas present. So. Right. So when 191 comes out around Christmas, the final version, hopefully we'll have a JRuby release at the same time with 191 support. So 
um, crossing our fingers. We're, we're leaning on Marson to do all of the internationalization stuff for us. So hopefully that, <laughs> hopefully that will happen by Christmas. OK, so it's trivial to call Java from within Ruby. And if you have a Ruby library you like, great. You should use it. Then it's portable across all the implementations. But sometimes, sometimes there's a feature that's missing from the Ruby library. Sometimes you want another option. And there's literally millions of Java projects out there. Yeah. So you should consider using it. Uh, another thing is if you're actually in a business and they already have done a large body of Java work, why go and write a REST or SOAP bridge to it when you can just directly call it? It's quick and dirty and fast. And uh, Java libraries tend to be cross-platform more often than not. So, right. so my fingers were crossed when I said that, but right. it's, it's usually true. So generally, you get the benefit of all those libraries. You know, XML is a perfect example. Recently, it was a big news that uh, libxml had been updated to run under Ruby. And, it was, and, and it's great. It's great that libxml works. There's probably 20 XML parsers on the JVM that have been working for years now. Um, and you could just use those from within JRuby anytime you want to. It's just Java code. You're just calling methods. Um, so those sorts of things, there's always lots and lots of choices on the JVM. Too many choices. But uh, with Ruby, it makes it trivial to call any one of those libraries. So when we were at Java 1, we saw this nice talk about JMonkey Engine. It's a 3D scene graph library. And I thought, ah, oh, this would be some really cool eye candy. So it's uh, OpenGL hardware accelerated uh, scene graph library. And it's used commercially by several companies. Uh, a perfect example of something that, that it's, a, it's a huge benefit. Do you want to run this, or should uh, I? Yeah, you can start it. All right. You, you'll have to play it, too, though. Well, yeah. You, so have, this you was, have to be second player, I think. This was originally like 800 lines of pretty messy demo Java code. So we'll run it first, and then we'll show you that, what that code looks like, too. And part of the fun was actually rewriting this and seeing how much does it look like Java after we're done rewriting it in Ruby. All right, so it's going to start up. Uh, so settings all look OK to me. So now this, the logic behind this is all written in Ruby code. Um, and it's just calling into the, the JME, the JMonkey Engine library, to do you know, the, the rendering part of it. I'm playing one player. There, might, there might be a bug in some of the explosion code. Yeah, that's, that's right. Tom's addition. You'll, you'll see that there's a little weird uh, set of code in there when I'm showing it. And you notice that it's actually doing like the the texture map or the bump map on the well, hills is affecting where the ball's going Check it go. out. When it goes over the water, you can actually see a reflection of the ball on the water surface. So it's cool. This is the stuff you can get with hardware acceleration. And as far as I know, I don't know if there's a scene graph library for Ruby. Does anyone know? I suppose you can call into C or C++ ones. I want to try this once and see if it works. Full screen. Oh, full screen. I'll sabotage, should work. sabotage the presentation here. Oh. No, I didn't like it because of the projector stuff. But all right. Okay. But do you see, I mean, it's, it's a library that's out there and people are using commercially that you can start building. You can build a game like this in Ruby really easily. So yeah, let's pop, um, over, pop to over to the code. And I'll let you. So there's the main King Pong. So yeah, here's the main class. At the top, we can see there's a class called main. It's Ruby, obviously. And it extends a Java class. So this is a Ruby class extending a Java class. It needs to implement two methods, basically a init and update. You'll see that's camel case. This is one of the few places where the Java kind of rears its head. Um, but if we actually look at the body of the init method, um, you can see that we're just setting up some domain-like objects, and we're appending them to the root node of the scene graph. It doesn't really look like Java at all to me. Do I have any camel case? Oh, a couple camel case methods. I, I didn't underscore those. In, J in Rub JRuby, you can actually use underscore or camel case methods. And in the update method, which gets called every time that there's a frame update, um, we just do our stuff. We update the sky and water. If there's any UI, we'll move up and down. If we run into a, a, a paddle or, or a, um, one of the sidewalls, we'll bounce a particular way. Looks just like Ruby code. If we'll, we'll just look at the domain of the ball for a it second. It is just Ruby code. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it is just Ruby code. But at some level, it hits Java. Yes, So some indeterminate level. We have a Ruby class ball. It extends from a Java class called Sphere. We have an accessor for velocity to control the ball's velocity. If we look at the bounce method, we just kind of affect the velocity. Again, 
doesn't look like Java at all. And it was, it was amazing how simple it was to translate this and how much more readable it was than the equivalent Java code. Right, and, you, and this is all Ruby code running at runtime, just sort of determining the direction, determining the velocity, all that stuff, and there was no noticeable performance slowdown from it. All right. So, continuing on to another practical area. Uh, one of the th big things that we've been touting with JRuby is that it's really, it's dead simple Rails deployment. And uh, now we've also started to expand out to other ways of doing deployment and other web frameworks. Uh, just last night, uh, the Glassfish team, Glassfish is the Sun's app server, they released the new version of the Glassfish gem. And you can gem install Glassfish and it'll pull it down. It's about a three, three or four megabyte gem. But it's essentially everything that you need to do a production deployment of Rails or Merb or whatever else in one gem, in one command. Uh, let's see, single process deployment. And of course, we're native threaded in JRuby, so this one process can be your entire server across cores. You don't have to have multiple processes. You don't have to do any forking tricks. You don't have to be doing load balancing across a bunch of them, making sure that zombies don't run away and making sure you kill off dead processes. None of that stuff you have to do anymore. One process, and it's deployed and running. Um, and, and really, it's like the simplest deployment literally possible. You, should, you install a gem, and you run a command, and it's done. So I'm going to go out. I've got a couple uh, sample apps here. It could be a tiny bit easier. Tiny bit easier. Script I, server. Oh, if it was the server script, I suppose. Tom's, Tom's pedantic about script server being the way. It's the only way. <laughs> All right, so I've got um, a, a test app here, which is just a Rails app. I've also got a Merb app here, you know, standard stuff. Um, and I'd already installed it, but you know, gem install glassfish, and you can pull it down. It's not very big. But what you get is this glassfish command. And you specify on this command, um, you can set up various parameters like you know, what port it's going to be on, et cetera, what environment you want to run. Um, but you pass the directory to your application and run it. And what this is going to do is it's going to start up the core of Glassfish, just the part that's responsible for serving pages fast, with a run of the JRuby instance inside of it. I'm running Rails 2.2 here, and you can see that it detects that it's running Rails, and it, so it does the Rails startup stuff. And it's now deployed the application at the root uh, context on my local machine. So if we bring this up now, there's our app. And so you get all the, the typical details here, you know, <laughs> running Java. Um, I've got it hooked up to the JDBC version of the uh, Active Record MySQL. We used to always say, point out the Java part and say, see, we're yes, not faking it. Yes, we love that. It. So this is like, the, like th three years on now when this was, this was so novel before, and now it's just, nah, it's, it's Java. Everybody knows it's running on top of JRuby. And I've just got one controller here that's, you know, trivial. It should be pointed out that neither one of us are Rails developers. Yes, so you will not see a whole lot of Rails information here. You, you guys can do Rails stuff or Merb stuff or whatever and let us know how it goes. Um, we just make it run well and, and make it deploy well. Uh, so like I said, it can also be done for a Merb app, and I think it works for like Sinatra and other, any other rack-based stuff. So one command deployment again, Merb app. And in the interest of time, I won't actually go and hit this, but you'll see, ah, detected Merb application. So it knows what the application is, does a little bit of inspection, and then it's done, it's deployed. And this is production server, this is done. There's no other fiddling around with this. You can put stuff in front of it if you really want to, to handle static files and whatnot. But this is a deployed production application. Can't get easier than that. And across cores again. So, okay, we'll drop back to the slides. We're doing good on time, I think. Mm -hmm. we'll have some room for questions. Okay. Okay, so we've... <laughs> We've always said it would be the holy grail if uh, Rails was multi-threaded. And this is because JRuby uses native threads. And it'd be nice to be able to make use of those native threads within Rails easily. Right, up until Rails 2.2, it prevented multiple requests from running through the same Rails instance at one time, because it just wasn't safe for it to do so. So the Rails folks were kind enough to actually make Rails 2.2 thread safe. Yes. And there's a special thread safe uh, mode, and it's a big deal. If we look down at the diagram, if we wanted to handle three concurrent requests, we'd actually have to start up 
three separate JRuby on Rails uh, instances to handle each concurrent request. This is all still in the same JVM, the same process, but it was more memory, like you would have with multiple mongrels, we'd have multiple JRuby instances to handle those concurrency issues. So, so with multi-threaded mode, it just starts up a single instance, and for each concurrent request, it just spawns a Ruby thread and handles the request. Um, pretty basic, and so there's a couple of benefits for this. First, since we only have one instance, we have more requests hitting the same code path, so Hotspot warms up faster and things optimize faster. Right. And, and the more important one is reduced memory. So we did the lame test. Um, we set that totally unrealistic Rails app that has one controller, one model, and one view, and then we flung a bunch of requests at it with a concurrency of 10, and then we looked at the heap. In, in thread safe mode and in a traditional Rails mode. And so I'll go over these, uh, um, this graph and least to most interesting numbers. Um, the least interesting is Glassfish, the yellow bar, which is taking about 30 megs in, in each case. Right, essentially the same amount of memory. And then for the run times, well, you can see that on the multi-threaded mode, that small blue thing is about one-tenth the size of 10 instances because we're only firing up one instance versus 10. You can imagine if we fired up 20 instances, that blue bar would be twice as high. But the most interesting number to me is uh, the application data. In the 10 instance mode, it's using about 3.3 megabytes per instance for application data. But if you go and look over at the multi-threaded mode, it's using about 0.5 megs for application data. And that, that frankly surprised me. Uh, that could just be simply Rails 2.2 improvements. Yeah, I would, yeah, yeah, for sure it could. And but they've the, done a lot of work to, to clean that up. The thing that's very surprising, too, is that the Rails, uh, um, the Rails instance stuff is about the same size. Mm. Yeah. So, so the, the, there is a, a caveat. Um, this is the size of the heap, the, or the, the amount of heap that's in, in use. Right. Uh, the JVM is generally going to allocate about twice as much, as heap, twice as much heap as is in use. Um, so you're going to get numbers that are about two times this for uh, a single, simple application. And there's a little bit of overhead for the JVM itself to start up. But at this point, with this kind of drop in memory, uh, we can easily beat any deployment that needs multiple instances. Um, and even single instances now, we're down more, much more on par as far as memory consumption goes. So now you can run a JRuby on Rails application in a 256 meg slice, for example, and it'll and, actually work. And what did you do the other day? You went and played with some of the um, I, and, settings. And uh, there's a whole bunch of settings for how you can tweak the way that the heap is laid out and the way it's allocating memory. And you can shrink it down pretty good. And so there's more research there, but this is, it, it definitely was the holy grail for us to have one instance be able to run all of the requests on the system. And there's one other caveat worth mentioning. Um, you can't lazily go and initialize a class variable without taking some care when you're doing it because now all these concurrent threads are trying to access your class at the same time. Right. Yeah, so the, so the Rails thread safety stuff is awesome, and it really is going to be a sea-changing event for Rails. Uh, a lot of the other frameworks realized long ago that not having the ability to run multiple requests at the same time was a problem. MERB especially has taken special care to make sure that things are concurrent from the beginning. Um, so what we can expect with Rails 2.2 being thread safe is not that it's going to be perfect right now. Uh, there's going to be libraries that break. Some of your applications, if you're doing Rails work, they're probably going to have broken areas in them. But you have the opportunity to find those problems and fix them now. You didn't even have the opportunity to do that before, and already some of the libraries, like the MySQL driver, have been fixed to allow better concurrency. So we're going to see a cascading effect from Rails being thread safe, and all of the other libraries and applications will follow. From a memory perspective, it's going to be well worth the effort on any large-scale app. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's probably worth mentioning that thread safety in Rails is going to help the green-threaded implementations and the non-parallel implementations just as much, because if you only have one core, you should only need one instance in that case. Um, and even if you have multiple cores, you're going to be able to reduce the number of Ruby processes you have to run, because it's going to be spending time in I.O., and then it can do another request while it's doing that. So spending time waiting for a, rec uh, a REST request, or waiting yeah. for a query, or whatever. Then it can be processing other requests at the same time. So thread safe Rails is a huge deal, there's a no huge deal. There's no process context switching either, so you don't have to involve the process scheduler and stuff in your OS. Right, so. right. You're going to be able to get a lot better performance out of that. Yeah, there's a question in front. Um, to do the glass fish, I assume you had to change the 
database connect strings in the database YML? Yeah, uh, all that I changed, I can actually show you what it looks like. It's really trivial. For all of the, the key uh, adapter implementations, there is a JDBC version. So if there's Active Record MySQL adapter, there is Active Record JDBC MySQL adapter. And there's a SQLite one, and there's uh, other, the, uh, the other databases. And all that's really changed in the app itself, I just generate it dash D MySQL and then go into database.yaml and we were hoping this would get fixed in uh, um, Rails 2.2 that you could do JDBC MySQL. It didn't quite get in there. So I just add in. JDBC there and then install the appropriate Active Record adapter, and it's done. And that's now using JDBC instead. There's a clever little hack they can use. Um, the database that YAML file gets um, run through ERB, so you can actually do a platform check and right, ice so out the JDBC part. In here, you throw your if if it's Ruby, use MySQL. If it's JRuby, use JDBC, and you can test on both. So uh, back to slides for a couple more here. OK, so FFI was uh, <laughs> a, recent, a recent thing that I think is it, it's really exciting that we now have this available. Uh, FFI stands for Foreign Function Interface. It's a way to portably call C functions directly from Ruby code and bind them directly into Ruby code. Uh, so it's, it's portable across implementations, unlike C extensions that you, that, that you may be familiar with, like SQLite extensions, other stuff like that. Um, the, the thing, what it turns out is that almost all of these extensions, a high percentage of extensions written for Ruby, just wrap some C library. And then maybe they add a little bit of nicety, they add some closure stuff, and they add some other APIs on top of it, but essentially they're just wrapping a C library. So why don't we just wire that in in a way that works across all implementations and write the magic around it in Ruby? And that's the idea behind FFI. And actually, it started in Rubinius. Uh, Evan came up with the basic API for it. And it's, it's really clean. It's really nice. I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, we liked it a lot. And we saw the, the benefit of having this as a cross-implementation C binding. So we implemented it in JRuby uh, and included it in 1.1.4. Uh, just last week, I think it was, uh, Wayne Meissner, the guy who implemented FFI for us in JRuby, implemented a C Ruby extension to also do FFI. So now you can use this same syntax, same script, never write any C code, and it will work across all three of these implementations, the C Ruby versions, JRuby, and Rubinius, and be able to call out to C libraries. Um, and it's gem install FFI for the Ruby one. Uh, like I say, Rubinius and JRuby have it built in. So here is a, a really quick example. I'll walk through this, and then I'll show you a couple more in NetBeans. So here we, we require in the FFI library, we, we've opened up our module where we want to store the C bindings for these functions. Um, we extend the FFI library. And from there, we're calling FFI functions to do the binding of these different methods for us. We specify which library we want to use, FFI underscore lib. And like it says here, C isn't generally necessary because all of these have the C library in. But it could be FFI lib, ncurses, FFI lib, DL, whatever else you want to call in. Um, and then attach function provides the name of the function in the library, the name in Ruby we want to bind it to, which is optional, uh, the argument types that we expect, and there's a, a bunch of symbols that it recognizes, and then the return value. So here we're expecting an unsigned int to be returned. We use the symbol uint for the, the signature. And so then these functions are actually bound, and at the bottom you see we're actually calling into posix.getpid, posix.getuid, and this exact same code works across C Ruby versions, JRuby, and Rubinius. So any library that you can call that you can wire up in this way, you can use portably across all of the Ruby implementations. And, and more sophisticated C structs can be mapped. Right. And I don't think I actually have a more complex syntax. You can also map in struct types. Um, I don't have an example of that handy here. Uh, here's an example where we're using more of an arbitrary pointer. Uh, this is uh, calling out to QSort, the QSort function in the C library. And QSort is interesting because it takes a callback. You pass in a function that it uses to do the comparison. So what would we use in the Ruby world to do callbacks? Obviously, we'd, we'd pass it a block, right? So that's how uh, I, Wayne and I were talking, and we talked a little bit with Rubinius guys. And this syntax that we've got down here, once we bind, we've got a callback that we're defining, a FFI callback, calling it QSort CMP, which we can use as a reference to that callback type from then on takes two pointers and it returns an int, all right? So down here you see that the QSort function takes that callback type, QSort CMP, 
and that's all that's necessary. So in this code here, we see we're calling libc.qsort with a block, and the block receives two pointer instances, can examine them in whatever way is appropriate, and then return an int out. FFI handles proxying all that back and forth and making sure that the callback is wired up correctly. So it's another really cool example. Um, and well, let's see if there's also PTY here. So here's a little, a little bit more advanced example with more functions. Um, this PTY is doing exec and dupe and other stuff for uh, file descriptors. Uh, here's an example where we've got a buffer. We're specifying a, a buffer that we want to use for reading and writing memory back and forth. So it's an arbitrary size buffer that we pass to C functions. We create our buffer, um, it's doing, and, and of course you can define your own methods on this FFI module to provide your API. And this is the right way to do this. You shouldn't be writing a whole bunch of C code that does all of your block management and does all of your methods, your extra methods on top of the library. Just do the basic bindings and let Ruby be Ruby on top of that library. Then we all can use it and we can all share that library. So that's, that's about it for uh, FFI. And I hope, everybody, I hope everybody starts using this because it really is <laughs> extremely exciting that we can now call into these C libraries and have it work in JRuby. We don't have to worry about can't build SQLite extensions because we don't support Ruby's API. Extra exciting since we don't support native C extensions. Yes, yes. So no more extensions. No more extensions. Um, so then the final thing here, a number of people asked about various aspects of what? Oh, one more. Yes, uh, just I think this is the second to the last thing here. Um, so a lot of people asked about the other aspects of Java. How can I use Ruby in different areas in the Java world? Uh, especially people coming from the Java side that wanted some sort of equivalent. So here's a, we'll run through a couple of these. Servlets, first off, is probably the, the most common one in this list that gets asked about. People want to be able to just write a servlet in Ruby. Uh, the simple way to do that right now is to write it as a little rack application, which is really trivial to do, and use Warbler to deploy it. Warbler can deploy any rack-based application. That's the way you should do it right now. Um, in the future, along with EE components, the second one here, implementing your own session beans and JMS beans and things like that, in Ruby, um, Glassfish, the Glassfish guys are working on having Ruby be a first class language in the app server so that you can actually say, I want to implement a, a session bean in just Ruby just Ruby alone, and Glassfish will handle instantiating JRuby and getting it up and running and providing that as a session bean. Did anyone so just shiver? So <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so you'll be able to write EJBs in Ruby. Isn't that what everybody really has wanted all this time? It would have succeeded if only it had Ruby syntax. It's amazing that people ask for this, right? Um, but, you know, it, it's out there. It's out there. Uh, mobile and embedded, lots of people keep asking us about mobile and embedded stuff. I think we get at least two or three questions a week from someone asking to run it on Android or Java ME. Um, and the answer is that it's absolutely possible. Uh, on Android and the, the larger ME profiles, it's actually not going to be terribly difficult to get it to work, because they are full Java implementations for some definition of Java. Um, the problem is that nobody's really working on it right now. We would love to see someone start playing around with JRuby on Android, and it would probably work great. It would probably work really well. Um, but uh, you know, if you've got, got an interest in doing Android development or other ME platforms, just let us know, and we'll, we'll find a way to, to get your code into the repository, get you commit rights, things like that. Patches so. accepted. Patches accepted, and if you want to just take over a whole project, that's even better. So, uh, and then normal Java type definition, so that I can write a Ruby script compile it, and then have my Java code just call it as a normal Java type, construct it the same way, call methods directly on it. This is planned. Um, the tricky thing here, and this is this, this kind of language theory stuff here, I will claim that Ruby does not have class declarations, okay? There are no class declarations in Ruby. There are class instantiations. You instantiate a class and execute code against it, but you do not declare a class. And that makes it extremely difficult for us to compile it to a normal Java type, because there is no type at compile time that we can create. Um, so we've got various tricks that we're going to use to try and basically make it look like a Java type, make it kind of feature, feature compatible with uh, Groovy, a language that's a little bit more tightly integrated with Java. Um, and I'm not sure exactly when we're going to get to this, but it's like a JRuby 2.0 sort of feature. Having done a fair amount of scripting of, of Java from within Ruby, I haven't ever found a need to actually do this. So. I haven't either, and, and, and it seems to come up more than I would expect, but yeah. I suppose it's people that still want to stay in their safe Java world and, and just write a little bit in Ruby, and that's, that's perfectly valid. Okay, so now if uh, P 
people are interested in using JRuby and you're looking for a list of reasons why other people have chose JRuby, we kind of have this common laundry list of reasons people have given us. And this is basically just testimonials we've gotten from other folks. Java app servers are everywhere, so you know why install new server software when you can just bundle it up into a WAR file and, and send it? Right, and actually there's a lot of Rubyists who've come to us and said, I, I'm trying to get Ruby in the door at a lot of these organizations and they just refuse to install all of the stuff I want them to install. But they already have a Java server. So it's so all it's about- the same thing. It's all about reducing barriers. Yes. Um, Java libraries that fill a void. Uh, David earlier gave a good example during his talk of needing, um, oh crap. Uh, SNMP version three, right. which wasn't supported by the Ruby equivalent library, so it saved their butt for that project. And obviously the GUI library that's available for, for the JVM swing, or SWT, there was also a, a SWT talk earlier for Glimmer. Um, those, there's no equivalent. There's no equivalent that's a nice, consistent plat cross-platform UI framework for Ruby. Code obfuscation, ahead of time compilation, or in the case of uh, ThoughtWorks, they actually Hack JRuby a little bit to encrypt source code. Right, very easy to do. Very that. easy to do. Um, running JRuby on Rails on an IBM mainframe, calling to MS SQL Server. Probably the weirdest combination we've ever heard, Which but they actually you can did do have it. someone doing that. A horrible, horrible combination of things. But hey, you know, whatever works. And speed. Right, definitely. The, the thing is, in our in our experimentation, we have we're very hard on ourselves about whether performance is good enough. Um, almost everybody that we talk to that uses JRuby to run Rails or to run other applications, they say that far and away it's faster than their old equivalent application they had in Ruby. Um, and the fact that when you, when you need really high performance code for mathematics or whatever, you can drop to Java instead of going calling out to C. Uh, again, it makes it much easier to sell to get it into an organization. So um, before the final slide, how many people have figured out what these pictures are? Java users? No, uh, um, every picture we've had in here was taken from Charlie's uh, <laughs> camera on the plane for uh, um, SkyMall. Out of the SkyMall catalog. Some of these are bizarre <laughs> pictures that they have in there. <laughs> but they seemed appropriate and I didn't have any pictures on hand so we, we threw them in there. I, I especially like, uh, <laughs> like this guy here. <laughs> That's Who knew you could buy a suicide device in SkyMall? <laughs> Really, almost, it's almost a terrifying picture. All right, um, so get involved. Um, there's contact information for us and you know, Twitter, and we've got IM if you want that too. Uh, we're on JRuby pretty much 24 hours a day. Somebody's there. Uh, the, you know, the wiki is probably the more interesting site to go to, but you can get JRuby from the main site. And uh, we've, we've got, I think, about five minutes for questions, so. Oh, no, that's, I started that like three or four minutes late. So. Oh, okay, so we've got about two minutes for questions, so. Really good question. Yes, anybody? Uh, yes? Uh, does GlassFish have automation for across nodes? Uh, I don't believe the clustering stuff is built into the gem right now, uh, but people are running with the full GlassFish, running Rails with clustering, and it works fine, works great. Uh, so that's, that's definitely a, a feature request if you want that in there. Or maybe it'd be a separate gem. You install GlassFish clustering, and then you've got it automatically. Uh, it's not in there right now, but it could be. Yeah, in front. Can you wait one back on processing or What kind of process? Uh, like background process. Oh, background process. Well, there's an ampersand that you can use to, uh, to background it, or no hub, or something like that. Um, the typical daemonization stuff that you use in Ruby to make it a background process doesn't work directly because it's depending on C calls and C libraries that we don't have. But I mean, you can run the JRuby process uh, in a separate, I don't know, what, what do people well, do for I that? Think, you can uh, start it up. Too bad Nick wasn't up here, but I think Nick is actually working on something to, to get better parity with some of the popular background process uh, packages. Right, right. It's, it's not as easy as running with Ruby because you need to be a little bit more explicit about, okay, I want to run this in the background and I want it to have you know, not have a terminal and things like that. But We'd it, like it's, it can be done, and people run Java servers in the background all over the place. Hmm. Um, other questions? Yes? Can you run um, uh, the uh, IRB, the JIRB IRB um, in 1.9 mode? Um, um, not at the moment. Not quite yet. <laughs> 
Yeah. But yeah, we will be able to. There's no reason that it would, would not work that way. Um, My, same, same sort of flag. I don't know. Th that's an interesting question. I don't know whether we, whether we include like IRB 1.9 executable that would run it separately, or if it'd be, we'd add a flag to our version of IRB, something like that. Oh, just yeah, add I a certainly flag. Could. I mean, it's all there. And, and the other question that comes yeah. up, and before anybody thinks of it, is can I use 1.8 syntax and have 1.9 libraries? And I'm like, oh, man, I don't know. That's a slippery slope right there. But yeah. theoretically, that sort of thing is possible. I just yeah, I, I don't know if I want to do it. Let's not go I, there. I feel kind of dirty thinking about it. So um, one, maybe one more question in the back there. Uh, how easy is it to write a library in JRuby but use it in a Java app? It's not as easy as it could be. The, the primary thing you need to do to get a callable from the Java side is create a static Java interface that represents that service or that utility, that library, and implement that li library or implement that interface in the Ruby code. From then on, that object can pass back and forth and look like that Java interface all the time. Um, we don't have a one-to-one -one mapping from Ruby classes created at runtime to Java classes. So there's nothing for you to instantiate, nothing for you to compile against. But if you provide that interface or extend an existing class, then you can implement a, a service for Java from Ruby code very easily. It's, yeah, it's really quite easy. It's just not quite as much fun as I think people would expect it yeah, to be. Yeah, I think people just want to have a compile phase, and then it's ready. It can be called from Java, and that's, that's the next step for us. And it uh, looks like people are coming in for the next one, so we'll call this done. Thank you very much. Thanks.